Well, hello, hello, and welcome to the Elsa Kerr Show. I'm your host, Elsa Kerr, and today I have a great guest, or actually two of them. I shouldn't say just one. There's two here. Uh, we have Daniel and Christina Deffenbaugh, and they're going to be talking about their 1042 project and uh, the important things that they are doing. So hi guys. Hi. hi. Thanks for having us. Yes, Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, it's my pleasure to have you on. And this is, and this is going to sound really terrible. This is one of my favorite topics. And that sounds kind of morbid because it's a little bit dark, but it, there's with, dark with the light at the end of the tunnel. So, um, and that's, that's, right. why, that's why I love it. So tell me a little bit, Daniel, if you will, about your background. I know that you're a former retired police officer. Um, tell me about that part of your journey. Yeah, so I started in, in 2000s when I started my law enforcement career. I was actually just 20 years old at the time. I wasn't even old enough to buy the bullets to put in my gun that I was issued. Um, so I started off pretty young. Um, so I started off, I, I, go, I went into it, of course, being the macho cop, thinking I was going to save the world. And little did I know the stuff I was going to be seeing day to day. So I, did, I worked uh, patrol for the first couple of years. And, and in a very short period of time, after two years, I was promoted to the narcotics detective. And I worked for a seven county drug task force and did a lot of undercover work and uh, seen a lot of stuff covering uh, work in narcotics, um, a lot of trauma and, and that goes along with that. And just that lifestyle of being undercover. And so I did that for three years and I had enough of that. So I came back to patrol, um, just went back to routine patrol and I did that for, for until 2014. And in 2014 is when I went out on medical retirement for some heart issues and PTSD issues. And uh, 2014 was, I was, it was about the time I was in the middle of uh, just a life crisis of, of just giving up on life. And I was an alcoholic and I was addicted to pain pills. And um, I got out of law enforcement at the right time. Honestly, I think if I would have stayed another week longer, I probably would have committed suicide. It was getting that bad. Um, so yeah, 2014, I went out and then I went through, uh, you know, six, seven years of just going through the depths of hell. Um, I went through a divorce, um, lost um, my family. I had my house foreclosed on, lost my job. So I felt like I lost my purpose. Um, I was literally homeless for a while, living in a camper my dad let me use on his property or sleeping at mom's basement and just really went through a, a terrible time of dealing with alcohol and, and pain pill addiction. And, and then, uh, in uh, 20 or yeah, 2020, uh, the year where it seemed to be a lot of people's worst year, I actually ended up being my best year. And, and I ended up getting saved and, and found God and, and he put a purpose on my life, uh, put a purpose on my life. And uh, so my, my life's changed ever since that day. And that was uh, August, around August 8th of 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of a, just a little quick note of the last 20 some years. Wow, that is so incredible. And, you know, it's such a common, all of the things that you said is such a common theme for so many of our first responders. Um, the the lack of the ability, it's not the lack of preparedness, it's the lack of ability to truly prepare for what you see and do on the job. And, and all the training in the world, and, and this is the part that civilians really need to understand, that all of the training in the world can never truly prepare you for the reality of the job. You know, you can do simulated um, calls and, and everything till you're blue in the face, until you can do them with your eyes closed and hands tied behind your back. It's not the same as reality. Um, how did you go in feeling like going into uh, law enforcement? Did you feel like you were just ready to take on the world and fully prepared for it? You know, honestly, at the time I did, but yeah. going back, I mean, honestly, I felt like I was prepared. And if somebody probably would have said, Hey, we need to get you prepared more you know, you need to do some mental health training and stuff. I was such an arrogant 21 year old. I mean, Superman is what I thought at the time, you know, so I, I don't even know if I would have even done it, but there, I felt prepared, but looking back, I know 100% I was not prepared and, and my ego got in the way along with just, there wasn't a lot of resources back then. Nobody, we, I think we had a two hour course in the police academy and that was on uh, death notification. And they, they tied in some mental health with that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, that was it. 
Yeah. And, and that pretty much like proves, I, um, I shouldn't say proves my point, but it kind of does proves what, you know, I, I believe to be true. And, and that's, you know, that they all go in, you guys all go in because that's how you're almost trained to go in. You know, nobody tells you any differently. Nobody's giving you that type of emotional guidance on the job. And, and that's the thing um, that so desperately needs to change, I think, in the whole, uh, the, the whole structure of policing really, or police training, that this emotional side of it, this mental health wellness part of it, um, because we do have to change that mantra, that whole idea that you have to be strong, you have to be silent, you have to, you know, be able to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. And it's not practical. It's not healthy. It's not realistic. And, and this is why, um, you know, people like yourself who've really been through hell and back um, are doing what you do. So um, we're going to bounce around a little bit, if you don't mind. I do, because I, I want to start talking a little bit about uh, 1042 Project. Um, t- tell us a little bit about how that came about. So it came about in August 8th of 2020. I actually went to uh, a counseling session I wanted to try a new place because I was having really the race riots and stuff were going on back then. I would see my brothers and sisters on TV just being assaulted and spit on and drugged through the mud. And I literally would just watch the news hour after hour and just cry literally. And I felt so hopeless. And um, I had a panic attack on June 13th, um, which happened to be my birthday that day. But we had a, we were out at a family get together and we got home and I was flopping in my bed. She had my wife had to call 911. And so it was after that, we um, decided to try another counseling thing. And we went there and it was so devastating. Uh, the guy was not meant to, to be helping first responders. And, it, and it, I walked out of there knowing I was going to kill myself. I, we were engaged at the time and we were, we were going to be married in a few months. And the thought of bringing her and her two beautiful kids in, in with, with me and my three kids, just the thought of bringing her into my life when I was still so damaged, I just thought I can't do this to another to another family. And so, uh, I got, we got out of that appointment and I came home and I didn't sleep that night. I did just sit and just, I mean, gut curdled and cried that night. And I went to work the next day. I was in a sales position then. And my boss came in and saw me crying at a desk and that's not like me to be crying and I mean, just crying where you can't breathe, you know? And he told me to go home for the day and, and which I did. And I decided I was going to kill myself on the way home. Mm-hmm. I was going to wreck my car in an area where I've been, I've covered, ever, covered a fatality before, so I knew it would work. And on the way there, uh, it was crazy. I just felt like, um, and I'm, well, as the time wasn't really a, a Christian guy, but I just felt the presence of God just telling me to, to turn and go to this lake that's on the way home. And I did, and I went there and I just bawled and I fell to the ground and, and I just told God to, that I can't do this anymore and to kind of use me or lose me. And I just wanted to die. And he kind of just showed me a vision of a police officer sitting in a bathtub like I used to do mm-hmm. with my service weapon and a bottle of vodka, pressing the gun up against my forehead, just hoping I'd get the courage or shake enough to, to pull the trigger. And I, so I saw this vision and, and in the vision, it was, I know this sounds crazy, but in the vision, I, I, I walked up behind the officer. When I put my hand on the shoulder, the officer turned around and it wasn't me. And at the time I could just feel the presence of, we're going to show the world what help is and what help looks like. And not in a cocky way, not like we have some special therapy, literally, like literally we're buying studio. We are in the process of buying studio quality equipment. We're going to show with our cameras and our audio, and we're going to go out and find, because the big problem out there, I know when I was looking was it's confusing when you Google for help and you try to find out what's out there, you don't know what you can trust. You don't know who's out there for profit, just trying to make money. Who's nonprofit, who truly wants to help you. It's so confusing. So 1042 project, we want to help be the bridge between the first responders and the help that's out there because there's all these people that are popping up that want to help the first responders and the first responders are not finding them. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have a vetted, we're going to have a website where when you come to our website, you can click on whatever category that you're struggling with. If it's depression or alcoholism or pill addiction or marriage problems or whatever it may be, you can click on that. And our team is going to be making eventually hundreds and thousands of videos for each different categories that we're going to be making kind of in a setting like this. In our, and we're going to be building a studio and we're going to be flying people in from around the country, uh, people like you, anybody that can just come in and we're going to make little 15 to 20 minute videos that we're going to be constantly just bringing out. And our goal is to get all the all of the nonprofits that are out there, people who have a true heart, like our organization does. We want to get them known and we want to help them get funded by getting known. 
And we want to be able to make it. The problem with first responders is they want to be able to do it discreetly. We don't want anybody to know, especially at the early stages. And that's our goal is, is we, we're going after the ones that are really, really lost. You know, we helped just, we're in the middle of helping a guy right now that was literally homeless six months ago, living in a box. And he was one of the most decorated officers I worked with. And now he is, he's doing so awesome. He's, now, he's working within our organization, doing fundraising. We are going after the guys that were like myself, the ones that were ready to pull the trigger, the guys and gals that are out there that are struggling, that maybe feel like there's no place that they belong. You can come to 1042 Project and reach out to us. We, we are not better than you. You don't need to wait till you, you don't need to wait till you're, you're feeling better or you're, af- you're not on the alcohol anymore or you're not on the pills. Don't wait for that. We are, all, we are all just broken individuals that are just like you at home. And we just want to walk alongside of you and have you walk alongside us and just join our team. There's no guilt or shame at the 1042 Project. We literally, we don't care if you got hired or just got fired. We don't care. We're, we're out. We just, want you, we just want to help give you your life back. And we want to equip people and we want to restore them. And we know when we do that, they're going to then find their real purpose. Because a lot of people like when, I, when me, when you lose your job, when you, when you, I had to leave, you know, I didn't want to leave. I had to leave. I needed to leave. Um, you feel like you lose your purpose. I honestly felt like I was meant to be a police officer and that's it. I mean, and, and now when you, when you can get equipped and, and restored, and then all of a sudden you can realize that you know, there's actually a purpose out there still that you can still be out helping people, helping first responders. So we want to equip them and we want to restore them. And then we're going to repurpose them right back into our organization. And we're, we're traveling around to all the different mental health symposiums that are being put on for first responders around the U S we're asking people, if you want to go to just reach out to us and join us, we want to pay for you to fly there and meet us. Our team's going to be there as well. Come walk alongside of us. And we're just going to spend a couple of days in fellowship, going to different classes and getting educated and get some healing together. And we're going to do some fellowship stuff at night and we're going to do some, maybe some hydrilling stuff whenever we can, if whatever area we're in, we'll try to do some whitewater rafting or whatever it may be just to just keep, make everybody feel alive again. So that's kind of our, our mission is create these videos where people can get help, even if they're not ready for it, they can get discreet help. And then when they're ready, they can reach out to us, start traveling with us. And then they're going to be more open to a, a treatment facility or a 30 day facility. You know what I mean? So we're just trying to help peel yeah. those layers at every level. That's so incredibly beautiful and so powerful. And by the way, uh, your story, it was not sounding crazy at all to me. Um, it's, that just it touched my heart. And, and I think that will touch so many people's hearts. And what an incredible calling. And you touched on how you as a police officer believed that that was your calling and, and, you know, that was your purpose in life. And, and I know that so many law enforcement officers feel that same way and they don't know how to be anyone other than that. And um, that's a scary place to be because you have to be so much more. You can't be your job. You can't live your job. You have to have a life and your job. And and we all know that, you know, policing is such a different, um, it is a calling. It certainly is. But you have to be able to separate yourself from that because if you don't have your own identity and all of those things then you know things like this will will happen uh when you leave the job and and i think that's such a powerful message that you're sharing about that uh about your experience with that and really all of your experience because we we know that very typically um first responders self-medicate with alcohol and that certainly can lead to prescription drugs and, and, you know, narcotics and all of that. So, you know, the things that you're talking about are nothing that anyone in your field, in your lane, are going to be surprised about. And, and they're going to see themselves in it. And I, and I think that's the key right there because you mentioned it before that it's really hard. You'd gone to somebody who should not have been trying to work with a first responder and deal with the types of trauma uh, first responders deal with. And that's really important that you have the background, you have the the firsthand knowledge and understanding. And and I think that's, that's going to be really profound for the people who, who come to you guys and find you. Yeah. I think, you know, um, just to go back to the, 
to the purpose thing. And it, it, it do feel like a lot of first responders feel like they lose their purpose, but I know she can talk more about it, but whenever we're working with somebody and they've been struggling for years and, and they've lost their purpose and they honestly just don't even know why they get out of bed every day. Mm-hmm. She can probably talk to you a little bit more about what it's like to see that sparkle in their eye. Once they start working with our organization and then they realize that they can use their hurt and pain for good, you know, and, and they can tell their story through our organization. They can travel with us and, and, and they can, they can use the hurt and pain to help the generation behind us. And it takes our generation right now of officers that are going to stand up and say, I'm willing to say what, what happened to me, no matter how shameful it may sound or how bad it may sound, that we have to be the ones to do it. And, and the guys and gals that are joining our organization and start to see that they want to help other first responders. So that's why they're going to be traveling with us. And we want other people to come with us. And then the first responders that are going to be there to walk alongside of you are the same ones that were just there getting the help a few months before that. And, and you can talk more about what it's like when you see the purpose come back in, come back to life in somebody. You've Absolutely. seen it in. Yeah. Christine, I want to know um, if you don't mind, if you're okay with it, I would love to hear your perspective because the spouse perspective on all of this, um, you know, really speaks to all the rest of us spouses who may have been dealing with, or may maybe are dealing with the same types of things and don't know how to respond and how to handle and how to recognize um, the things that are going on. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So um, just to kind of give you some background, um, Daniel and I weren't together while he was a first responder. So by the time, um, you know, we were seeing each other, um, it was something that like, I knew that he was a police officer, but we didn't really talk about the PTSD symptoms that he was experiencing, because as a lot of first responders can relate to, I'm sure it's not something that you just want to like openly talk to people about like, Hey, I'm struggling with this. I can't sleep at night. I have nightmares, you know, things like that. Um, so it was just something that I kind of noticed things along the way. And I was kind of piecing things together, um, myself and I have a psychology degree. So that in combination with what I was seeing, I'm like, Hey, have you ever looked into, um, to seeing if maybe you've got PTSD (laughs) and he was like, um, I think, I think that I'm, I've got that taken care of. It's, it's better now, but I, I like Daniel's journey. I feel like is going to be relatable to so many people because he can really relate to, like he was saying, meeting people at every level, Daniel's lived through that. And so like, from my perspective, I saw it from the other end, you know, being with him when he wasn't ready to talk about it. And I think it's so important for spouses and family members to just be intentional about making making it a safe space. And that was the number one priority that I tried to communicate to Daniel was that, Hey, if you're uncomfortable talking about it, that's okay. Like I can just sit with you through this. And then when he did start bringing up pieces here and there, I never shamed him or Mm -hmm. judged him. It was just love. Like I'm, I'm sad that you're feeling this way and I want to be with you through all of it. And let's, let's work on that together. Let me let me be with you as you heal. And just, I think it was really helpful for him to finally just be able to talk about it. And there were so many times um, that just as, as time went on, he would say, I've, I've never said this to anybody before. I've, <laughs> I've never told this to anybody before. And the farther along he got, the more he was able to talk about it. And then we finally get to the place where he's like, was ready to try telling somebody else after he was able to share that with me. So I do want the spouses to know that you're going to be that first place that your first responder is going to turn to because you're there every day, you know, and and you're going to be the one to see these things and recognize it. And, and I know that because the symptoms of PTSD um, come out in, in hard ways, right. In a struggle, you know, like alcoholism, different addictions, things like that. Those are hard things, but they need support in that. And, and so just being honest with each other and loving and supportive is just so important. And there is healing, it can get better. And, and I think that having that safe space at home, that safe, encouraging space, really, I would say provides a good foundation for your loved one to accept what they're going through. Cause that's a hard thing too. He had to go get to the point where he was willing to accept what he was feeling so he could say yeah i'm i'm struggling yeah, and, if you and if i would have got shut down by you mm-hmm. it would have ended right there i probably wouldn't ask for any help any further help but because she made it so 
free and, and just made it, you know, there was no guilt or shame to it. Then it was, it just made it further. And once I started talking to her, then I was able to talk to the next person and the next person. And now I'm able to go to onto a podcast and, and openly talk about it. So here we are. But yeah, so she's been there. She's, she's got to be there from the, when I was broken, but she's been that, there for all the, the, when I was broken to, to where I'm at, where I'm at now. And that doesn't happen without her telling you that. <laughs> and another reason that we're so excited for the different elements of what we're doing is one of the biggest things that I saw in Daniel's healing process is when the first responders who have um, similar trauma get together and they're talking with each other and they're sharing stories and the light in their eyes when they see, wow, all the pain that I've been through, I'm not alone. Somebody else gets it. Somebody else feels it. And I know like when Daniel went through years of struggling, you know, you felt alone and isolated yes. and not knowing that so many people around him uh, we're going through the same things. And so that's a, that's one of the biggest things that we want to hit on with first responders who are hurting is you are not alone. People understand and want to help you in, in yeah, just uh, providing that community and connection. It's such a powerful, powerful experience to be able to not only understand where somebody's coming from, um, but like you're saying, um, I'm just imagining seeing that that light in their eyes um, come back to them and that understand that realization. Um, and it breaks my heart a little bit too that anyone like you, Daniel, and and any of our first responders um, could go through such incredible darkness and despair and loneliness, really. I mean, there's probably nothing worse than being in a crowd of people and feeling completely alone. And, and I think that there are a lot of first responders out there that feel that way. And, um, you know, like the two of you are saying, just, I, I think it's got to be that, that dawning moment when they realize they, they are not alone. And, and uh, I have to tell you, speaking of, of light emanating, you two, the two of you have such a wonderful light about you. Oh, and thank you. You're so welcome. And, and, and I see it in uh, the, the looks and exchanges between you two and, and the, the way you communicate. Um, I, I can easily imagine that when first responders uh, come to you guys, that they feel that and see it as well. So I, I suspect you're doing an incredible job at what you're doing. Thank you started you. this in in 2020. Is that correct? Is that is that when it's, you started the? 10th? Yeah, so that's when that's when it was first put on my heart was 2020, and that, that was the day I was driving home from work and I was going to kill myself, and I had that put on my on my heart. And I got home from work that day, and and I told her about it, and she said, "You want to tell me you said about the day before when we were at this appointment?" Yeah, she had like this other vision. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it was. It felt weird. So I didn't even tell him right away when, when we left that appointment together, um, like as we were closing the door, I just like kind of saw, I guess is the best way to put it, saw Daniel on a stage talking to people. And at the time that was all that I knew that it was, was people. And then off to the side, talking with a group of individuals and just like ministering to them. But I didn't know what it meant at the time. And I thought, hmm, that's weird. And I just didn't really say much about it. And then Daniel shared with me what was laid on his heart. And I'm like, you know, that's interesting because yeah. I saw something. And so, yeah, that was. So we just said it out. We sat down then and started talking about it. It was eight days after that. We bought the domain for 1042 Project. And mm -hmm. we call it the 1042 Project because around here anyway, some of the 10 codes um, is for off duty. And it seems like all the, the officers have all the resources when they're working. It's when you go home and you, you go off duty. And that's the time we want to focus on is the off duty. So that's why we named it that. But that's why we named it that. And then, um, so that's when it started. So then we just, we just, she asked me a really good question. She's like, well, as we were building this, she's like, because we started to write down everything I felt like God wanted us to do. And honestly, the whole list would have been, and it would have saved the whole world. And it's like, mm -hmm. we can't do all of this. <laughs> this makes no sense. We can't have treatment facilities and run conferences and, and have peer support and all this stuff, but come to find out we actually can because we're just out showing the help that's out there. So we don't have to actually provide the help. We're just out building connections and, you know, going to conferences and having people walk along and walk alongside them and, and creating these videos to show what help is. So we, and then she basically just asked me, what would you have needed? What would younger of Daniel needed back then? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, you would have had to remove all the excuses and the main excuse would have been not letting anybody know I was getting help. So 
that's why we're, we're coming up with the video library where you can just, if an officer gets off for work at two in the morning and they're having that, that deep down motion and they're, they're hurting and they're feeling suicidal, whatever it may be, or they want to grab the bottle where they can just get a 15, 20 minute video of hope. Um, we, 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 we're focused on the restored part. We don't focus on the deaths and all the suicide. We know those are all happening, but we want to really focus on the positive side and the restoring side and the celebration of life side. And, um, so we, we just started piecing that together. And, and so we came up with the videos. Um, and then the big thing would have been, you know, another big thing would have been cost. Um, mm-hmm. Seems like so many of our first responders, including myself, we, we start to have mental health issues at work. So we think we need to buy a new four-wheeler. That's going to help us feel better. And then we need to buy a camper. Well, the camper's cool, but now we need a boat. And we keep buying this stuff. And we think it's mentally going to help our, our mental health, right? These are things I need, babe, because I worked all these hours and I need this boat. So those things come with a cost and they literally come with a cost, right? So now you're working overtime to pay for all these toys that were going to help you with your mental health is how you sold it. And now you're, you're, you're getting off of work at four in the afternoon, but now you're working overtime, you know, a shift that you have to sign up for from four to midnight to help cover these things. So expenses, a lot of times with first responders are not good. Let's be honest. A lot of times credit's not good, especially when they're really have struggling with mental health. So we want to remove that cost. So we're, we're doing a lot of fundraising. Uh, we, we got a $50,000 donation last week we're excited about. Um, we're getting ready to start some fundraising campaigns to where people can go to our website and become monthly donors. And then you can also sponsor different packages, uh, a first responder package where they can travel to a mental health symposium with us. Those usually cost around $1,000 and you can just pay, even if you're only pitching five for it, where people can buy scholarships to where it's about a thousand bucks. So anybody, no matter where they live in the country, can fly to the symposium, meet us there, and just have a great, uh, just a week of hope and, and some fellowship. Um, so that, that we kind of started that is trying to come up with that, the excuse of money. Um, and then the excuse of not wanting to do it alone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it alone. I would want fellow first responders. For some reason, first responders really kind of only relate to first responders. You know, when we sit down and talk to counselors or our parents or our wives, if you're not a first responder, we, we kind of don't, we, we hear you, but it's not the same. Um, so we, we wanted to build an organization where we're not telling people what to do or how to do it. We're literally just out and getting help for ourselves. And we just want them to join us, walk alongside of us and let us pay for you to come and join us. Um, so we're trying to just cover all the different excuses that I would have came up with. And I could come up with a lot. Was there any other excuses? I'm <laughs> Those were the main ones. Yeah. yeah, I love that. And it makes really, it truly makes perfect sense, um, you know, because and so many things that you touched on. Uh, are really, really important. And and one of those things being that, you know, when they're on the job, the likelihood of them uh, talking about their trauma and talking about their feelings and, and things that are going on emotionally with them are very, very slim for all the reasons that we know. They're afraid um, that they could lose their job. They are afraid that their peers won't respect them. Um, so having something like what you're doing, having the the accessibility to these tools, to these it, to the inspiration and the motivation and and the hope at their fingertips, um, at literally the click of a button, they can get help, and nobody else has to know about it unless they choose for anybody to know about it. And yep. I, I think that's a great motivator right there for our first responders who are struggling to get that help. So the way you're doing it is phenomenal. And it shows that you are, you know, a a first responder because you get it, you know, and and that's exactly what they need. They need someone who knows and understands. And and same with you, Christina, you know, on the spouse side of it, um, do you deal with spouses as well? Or are you at this point in time solely focused on the first responders? No, we believe in a whole family approach because it definitely, it, it takes, it takes everybody, you know, and, and spouses need um, those resources too sometimes. So yeah, we, um, we support the spouses, the yes. families as well. We want you to fly with, we want, we want to buy you a plane ticket and, and to come with your, your first responder and bring he or she with you and walk with them because it does, it takes a whole family approach. And mm-hmm. You know, your spouse doesn't know what they don't know. And by going to these conferences and sitting down and listening to people on stage, just talk about their stories and pour their heart out and be open, honest and transparent. And just for your, for your spouse to hear that is, is great too, because they don't know what they don't know. And they only hear 
one side of the story and that's your side. And a lot of times we're not being honest with our spouses about what's happening at work. And so, yes, this is a full family approach. It, it has to be. Um, you, you can't do this alone. And that's the whole thing with 1042 Project. There's nobody walks alone. That's yeah. beautiful. Tell me, um, tell me a little bit about the website. Um, what's the website and, and what are some of the things, again, that people, when they go to that website, that they can find on there? Yeah, so if you go to, it's 1040, 10-42project.org. Um, we also have a Twitter. No, I always get this messed up. We always have a, she do the social media. We have the tic, <laughs> we have TikTok. We have TikTok, Facebook, and then our YouTube channel. Yeah, and we will be um, vlogging kind of everything we do. So as we travel to symposiums, we have, we just bought a whole bunch of money in professional video recording equipment and, and stuff to document what these symposiums are like. Because again, we want to show people what help is and what it looks like. So we want them to see from the beginning to the end of what it's like to go to these symposiums. Um, so you'll be able to follow along with us as we travel and, and see the different people that are at the symposiums and kind of see all the fun we're doing. So even if you're not there, you're going to get some help. And, and we're going to be written out an area at these symposiums. We're going to be setting up our portable studio because that's where there's already authors there. There's already people there at these conventions that are speaking and you already have first responders that are there. So we're gonna be setting up our own little area um, outside the symposium area. We'll set up our studio equipment and we'll just be bringing in different people, different experts that are already there and just doing 10, 20 minute videos with them, getting them known, letting people figure out who they are, how they can help and finding out what resources they offer. So that way, when you go to our site, you click on the category you're struggling with, it's not just videos, it's true resources of people we've made videos with. You can see what it's like. If it's a treatment facility, we wanna to go to that treatment facility and walk in there with our cameras and show you what it's like to walk in the door, what it's like to spend a week in that place. Um, when one of our first responders go there, if they're open and willing, we want them to video, you know, to tell us about it along the way so we can show people what it's like. And we already have some people that do that are going through treatment and they're willing to video blog. Uh, what it's like and, and what it's like to walk in and just kind of share that. So we'll have that on the 1042.org and on all the social media sites. Um, this is where the videos will be on there. There You'll also see some, some local meetings for some peer support groups that are popping up around here that we're doing monthly. Um, we hope to get those going up around the nation. Um, on there, there's a um, get connected button where you can reach out to us. If you're a first responder or family member out there and you want some more information about what we're doing or what mental health symposiums we're going to be at, and, and maybe you want to go to those with us and go, just go to the website, click on get connected, put in your information. It's all confidential. Um, me or my team will reach out to you and uh, figure out what resources you need. Um, there's no shame, no guilt. We're not going to ask you to prove your income, nothing. You need something. We're just, we're, when we, the, if we have the resources, we're going to provide it for you. Um, so go to there. And when you go to that Get Connected, that's also a waiting list. Um, we're trying to, we do have money and resources, but we got to fundraise as we go, right? This all costs money. Um, and the more people I can get in there on the waiting list, it does help us for fundraising because then I can tell them not only are you giving money to an organization that they're trying to figure out what to do with it. We have a full battle plan what to do with it. We just need the money. I've got people on a waiting list already. As soon as we get the money, we match it up to that person. Boom, we're sending them to a mental health conference. And we're, we're, we're just in the trenches. We're not people, we're not an age, we're not an organization just helping from the distance. We are walking side by side, literally with these people and, and rebuilding them and equipping them and restoring them. So you can find that on the website. Um, what am I missing? Um, we do have some of our intro videos on our website yeah. as well. So um, if anybody's kind of curious to, um, you know, kind of get an idea of what our videos are you know, looking like stuff like that. Um, we do have a series of intro videos up. So definitely take a look at that and um, following us on Facebook, then you'll get those updates um, as we post them. But yeah, just a good, our website's a good place to um, get a chance to see some of our intro videos and then get connected. Like Daniel said, um, there's the button to give if you'd like to give. And there's also um, a letter from Daniel kind of going over his story and the heart of 1042 Project and you know why we're doing what we do. Yeah, and there's some clips on there from a documentary that I'm gonna be in um, called Residual that's gonna be coming out next year. There's some clips on there. Um, um, what else I was gonna say? There's the get the give button is also on the front page. If you're somebody at home and, and you wanna help out and you wanna maybe sponsor a first responder to, to go to one of these symposiums or we're gonna have different um, counseling packages and stuff where the people can buy to where you, you can buy 
you know, six sessions for somebody and we'll, we'll get that to somebody. Um, so there's several th things. If you go to the Get Connected, that's the main thing. Reach out to us. Let us know what, what your needs are. And if you are somebody that is providing help to our first responders and you want to get known, you want to make a video, video with us, reach out to us on that. We would love to come to your location or have you flown here and make some videos with you about what's on your heart and uh, how you're going to be able to help our first responders. Because the problem is a lot of the first responders don't know what to trust out there. But if they can see fellow first responders like me and other ones all around the world getting in front of the camera and talking about these and sitting down with these organizations and talking about our experiences with them, then other first responders are going to be able to go to our website and know that it's a trusted place, that if they find a place on the 1042 website, they know we've been there, we checked it out, we've looked at them, and uh, that it's somebody that they can trust. Um, so that's one of the big things is just we want to help filter out some of the bad help that's out there and some of the good help and, and make it easy for first responders to just come and get clean, true help discreetly without all the garbage that the internet can bring trying to find help on your own. Uh, that is truly, uh, that's a godsend really for, and I mean that very sincerely, uh, based on our conversation, that's truly a godsend, uh, everything that you're doing and the way that you're doing it and with the heart that you're doing it with is, is so uh, wonderful to just be a teeny tiny speck of a part of. And uh, I, I honestly, I can't thank you both enough for sharing your journey. And it, it takes tremendous grace and courage and strength to share such personal stuff and to be doing it for the sake of others. And, uh, you know, that you're still, I, I know you're not on the job anymore, Daniel, but it, in a way you are because you're, you're still, uh, you're still that first responder heart, uh, which is giving back to others and, and very selflessly too. So, um, tremendous thank you on behalf of anyone who sees this and gets to know the two of you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And thank you for thank what you so do. Much. I love, I love this platform that you're doing and thank you for giving us a voice. I, I really appreciate that. Oh, it's my honor. My honor. Absolutely. Guys, this was Daniel and Christina Deffenbaugh. They have the 1042project.org. Go to their website, follow them on social media, get connected with them. And if you are a first responder or you know and love a first responder who is struggling, please, please, please connect them with these people. They are Wonderful. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Take care. Hey, family, if you're looking for the perfect gift for the reader in your life, why not check out one of my books? They're all available on Amazon and most major online book retailers as well as elsacurrent.com.